All right, I think we're live. Um, I'm doing it a little differently tonight. And so I can screen share at the end. So it's gonna look different on your end. Um, I have some really big news at the end of our time today. And it is a, it's a good thing to pay attention to the end. So if you're watching tonight, um, this is for you for sure, or a replay. Um, there'll be something else for those of you that catch tomorrow as well. So now I gotta remember which <laughs> camera to look at. I'm doing it, doing it different. So this has got to be, it's got to be good because I've been in a battle. I've requested a lot of prayer from a lot of you, and I thank you beyond words for praying. So thank you so much. And I'm just checking here to see if I can um, watch your comments on Facebook because I was not able to see them the other way I was filming. So uh, this page is new and so for anybody, oh, I see it, Marsha. Oh, praise the Lord. Okay, this is this is a new and better way. God is already responding. I can see the comments all on the right and it's got its own little box. They weren't there before. I was filming on my phone before. Um, this is so good because now I'm going to screen share at the end and I'm up leveling my technology so I'm gonna try to look at the camera it's a new place for me <laughs> so I apologize if I'm looking down but again I just want to say to you thank you uh, for those of you that have been praying um, fiercely this is this is not easy I'm just gonna be honest with you the word is powerful it scares the enemy literally to death and it's been a battle it, I, I need you to know these things so that you don't think I'm different from somebody else. I know many of you, I told you yesterday, you guys are going through battles and I am as well. And so we're in this together. And I know that the most important thing in the word or in the battle is to be in his word, in his presence and in unity. Um, we know that the, when the sheep gets outside the flock, and it's an isolation, it's not a good thing, and we want to squeeze back in. So I'm squeezing myself in the middle of the flock this evening and saying, I need to gather with you all. So I'm just so glad to see you all here. I'm going to be trying looking at the right places um, today. So, okay, yay. So we have just a couple minutes for us to start praying. Um, and again, this is the last day of the challenge. I know that tomorrow is, um, it's like you said it was a four day challenge because there'll be even more um, prizes tomorrow for those that take action. But there's a prize tonight, um, a potential prize for somebody uh, that takes action tonight as well. And I think it's gonna be a good one for you. So um, must be a good one, like I said, because <laughs> Jiminy, uh, been quite, quite a show here. So. Whew, I'm just going to jump into prayer because it's what we need most. So Holy Spirit of the living God, I welcome you into this time. Have your way. Holy Spirit, have your way. God, I'm asking you to get so much glory out of this. Do whatever you want to do. Get so much glory, God. This is all for you. It's about you. We love you, God. And I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, would you bless each person gathering with new, new revelation of the God that we serve, who is faithful, who is mighty to save, who hears our cry, who does not leave us nor forsake us. Have your way, God. We love you so much. You are worth everything. You can have it all, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Meg, I see you too. Look at this. I am stepping up the game. Yay! Now I can interact a little better because before it'd be like a little comment here and then nothing and then... So this will be so great. So for, for sure, if you have something to tell me, I'll, I'll actually see it this time. So, all right, I'm going to try to keep it together, but I've got a box of tissues here in case um, I need that. I'm going to try to look up here at my new camera. And uh, yeah, so whew, I'm going to get into chapter two. I'm telling you what, it's just it, I'm just going to declare that this is going to break chains for people. There must be something really big here. So I'm so excited to share it with you. And if you're a dude, I'm sorry, but sometimes we have to cry. So, my husband's already seen it. All right, chapter two. 
Um, remember, simple. I'm showing up regardless of what is going on. I show up for Jesus. Daniel, good to see you um, from Delaware. I was wondering if, where you were from. So, um, but we show up in the fire and in the good times. And so tonight is the fire for me, for sure. I, we initiate with worship and I just declared up Stairs and I was praying, just God, do it. You are so good, just do it. And I'm worshiping in, in, Him in the fire. And then I go to M, make space. Like this would be a good time just to like pull off and not do something. But I was requesting prayer because I'm making space for God tonight, for Him to be glorified through His Word that Jesus commanded us to teach and prepare. We've prepared ourselves for this. We've looked at our person that we've like cherish this mark. We've, we've looked at the context. We're not just going in and just hoping to understand that we have done the work to prepare. So S-I-M-P, and we get to linger now together. And for me, this is the sweetest spot that I can be besides with my family. It's right here in his word. I just, I just love it so much. And so I'm praying, oh, I'm going to get through this. I am praying that, that this is just blessing you as well. I pray it blesses you doubly what it blesses me. All right, so linger longer and enjoy. Enjoy the adventure. And so I am looking up to Jesus tonight. I'm going to enjoy what he wants to do. So as we look at um, verse 1 in chapter 2, we have to remember what did we just look at yesterday that we kind of getting ready to see um, and I guess the enemy didn't like it because <laughs> it was authority, authority in Christ. We were looking at the, we looked at four things and we're ready for the fifth thing that Jesus showed right away. He had authority over and absolutely I can go up and down and I feeling my authority in Christ because I'm human, but that's why I stick in the word and I stick with my people because they'll remind me when I'm weak. So the four things, remember number one, the top section was Jesus has authority over unclean spirits. And this is partially why they're ticked off. Number two, he has authority. And this was over verses 29 through 31. This was in chapter one. He has authority over disease. He is the great healer. He is Jehovah Rapha. He has um, authority over sickness and disease. Number three, that section was 35, verses 35 through 39. And he has authority over personal direction or personal mission. He's the one that directs our path. If we want to be on the right path, we got to be checking with him. Number four, the last thing we looked at was leprosy, which was an interesting kind of situation that he, he took authority over. Remember, the leprosy was like, what does that look like in the Old Testament? We kind of looked at that. But now we're looking at number five. Number five, I want you to, I'm just going to tell you right now so you can get it written down. You can put a bracket around the next paragraph um, in chapter two. And number five, he has authority over forgiveness of sins, which might be the one most people know, but I want us to look at it afresh because, oh my goodness, is this important. I don't care if I've known it every year that I've been with Jesus. I need to know it afresh today. Because we don't want to be complacent when we come before the Lord and we seek to humble ourselves and ask forgiveness for a look we gave somebody or an attitude or whatever. That's an always thing, right? All right, so here we go. Verse 1, and when he, Jesus, returned to Capernaum, remember that's kind of the setting where Peter's home is at, after some days it was reported that he was at home. And now we think, was his home in Capernaum? Uh, we believe it was Peter's home, and that was uh, pictured in the chosen, but also in the commentaries. It kind of thinks that as well. These are just details to help build that scene. You wonder how the directors filmed it. They read the Bible, and they looked at the details, and they made the chosen. Verse 2, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. So now we're picturing it full, maybe like kind of like just almost like you're hot because you're just sticking together. And... Um, Let's see, let's go to the second part of that sentence. And he was preaching the word to them. So people are flocking to hear his word. They came to hear the words out of his mouth because they're powerful. Verse three, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. I would circle four men 
because I want you to consider what it takes sometimes to get one person to the foot of Jesus. You know, sometimes it's not enough and I need my husband to come beside me and we, we help shepherd someone together. And sometimes it takes five of us in a prayer setting to just bring the words of wisdom and knowledge and, and healing and deliverance to somebody, not just one, four. So, you know, as we look at it, we comprehend the four, we see the four and the interpretation of that. Man, sometimes it takes more than one application of that. Remember my three steps to linger is, whoo, we need to work together. And are you willing to make a scene for Jesus? Let's keep going. Verse 4. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed with uh, which the par paralytic lay. And I think that's where I'll admit timidity in my past has kept me like, well, that would make a scene or I don't want to look like I'm, you know, wanting to rush forward. And there's just some times where it's like, Come on, get past ourselves. If Jesus is there, what would you do? Peter jumped in the water instead of waiting to paddle to shore. Like this is faith. Okay, this is surrender. We go on to verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith. So I do like a squiggly. I don't just circle. I do a squiggly around faith. Because I look throughout the scriptures where it talks about faith. And I look at what they say about Jesus. Um, and what he, when he sees faith and when he sees lack of faith, I study that because I think, well, I don't want to be the one of little faith, like he says, sometimes says, and what is he, what is he looking at when he sees great faith right here? It's desperation. It's making a scene. Hello, Kelsey and Jamie. Um, it's just making a scene to get to Jesus. So, I mean, are we, are we willing to do that? All right, so he, he says to the paralytic, not what we are expecting. I mean, clearly he can't walk. But look what Jesus says. Son, your sins are forgiven. All right, so I, again, I, I'm, I'm taking red in, in my Bible and I'm looking at sin. I'm looking at times of repentance or persecution. I'm looking at that kind of together and kind of categorizing it in my gospel so I can kind of flip and see different themes. But what I see right there that I wrote down is, and the commentary says this as well, it looked like Jesus had to deal with his heart issue before his physical issue. Now, that's not my idea. That was kind of, you kind of might think, well, why'd you forgive his sins first? But even the commentary said, we maybe think that that was his condition was due to his, I don't know, maybe he was drunk and he fell off a building. Like, we don't know. Jesus maybe had to forgive the reason. All that to say, all we know is that Jesus dealt with an inside issue before he dealt with the physical issue. And I think that's very hard because if someone brought a paralytic in to us, wouldn't we say, oh, we want to do the healing first. But Jesus has words of knowledge and wisdom straight from the Father to know, I got to get to the heart first in this instance. But I also want you to write down forgiveness, maybe in capital letters, maybe starred on both sides, but forgiveness is key, not just to be forgiven, but to forgive. Because the pastors that I know that deliver, that have a deliverance ministry that are, you know, working in that anointing are constantly talking about a block for someone to get set free is unforgiveness. So a heart issue can block a healing or deliverance thing from what we're seeing. God is way more concerned about our heart than anything else, but he wants us healed and whole, absolutely. So here we go. Let's continue to look at it. Verse 6. Now some of the scribes are sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming because up to this point, nobody ever claimed to forgive sins but God, obviously that was the only thing. So they just, this was not known to them. You could almost give them a little understanding like, well, that would have been shocking. You know, if you're sitting in a prayer sitting, all of a sudden someone acts like God. However, they didn't have spiritual eyes to see what other people saw. They said, who can forgive sins but God? All right, so what I want um, to also say is uh, next to, I'm going to go back for just a second. I want you to look up later another faith story. Um, so go back to faith and right off to the side, Matthew 
8.10. I just want to give you one more example because I feel like that will be helpful. Matthew 8.10 um, is going to be where Jesus sees the faith of the centurion. Um, and there, there's also the woman that we just saw in The Chosen on Sunday who has the issue of blood. And she's reaching for just the him. And she's healed because she knew if she could just touch him, she'd be healed. That's faith that brought that healing. Okay, so faith is a big deal. All right, um, but thankfully for this guy, the four men had great faith. So here we go. We're going to go on to, just looking at all my notes here, um, verse 8. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned themselves, said to him, I want you to put a square around spirit, or even perceiving in his spirit. What the text is saying is he perceived what they were questioning and they didn't say anything. Why do I know that? Because the next line says, why do you question these things in your hearts? So when I line up scripture with scripture and I just said, Jesus is very concerned about the heart. Here's another example. The Holy Spirit told him those men are questioning and they doubt. And he spoke through a word of knowledge to address them. Okay, so that's a spiritual gift. So again, you could put word of knowledge by perceiving in his spirit, just off to the side. Now, verse 9, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. All right, so there's another command. I note that that healing that I can, I can highlight in purple or what have you is a command to rise up, he told him. Remember the other one, he said, be healed. Verse 11, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately, there's that action pack, picked up his bed and went out before them all. So that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. So glorifying happened this time. That's the best part, but we know it doesn't happen every time because many times they want to kill Jesus after this has happened. So I want you to underline glorified God, and I want us to be aware that that's not always the reaction that your friends or family or maybe the environment that you're going to be in does when you maybe have a testimony of deliverance or healing. It's going to be like, mm, I don't know if that's a thing. You know, it's, it's the part that prepares us for it. Well, they've, they doubted him then. They're likely going to doubt us now. They, I love it when they glorify him, but they don't always. All right, so now we're going to go to the number six reasons of how Jesus proved his authority. So put a bracket around verses 13 through 14, and that is going to be number six, and he and it's men, okay? It's men, and it just is just interesting in that men still have a choice, but my commentary is saying, you know, he's demonstrating his authority. He commands, and people follow, and that's really important to think about. Who am I willing to surrender to and be obedient to? All right, so verse 13. And by the way, I just love, Daniel, your comment. Jesus' goal is to bring complete wholeness to people. Yes, which is why he calls them to himself. So watch this. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him. He doesn't get a break, I'm telling you. And he was teaching them because that's what he does. And as he passed by, this is that scene that's, my favorite scene, I think, in The Chosen, but he saw Levi, put a square around Levi. Many of you know that is another name that they called Matthew, so just off to the side, write Matthew. And they're not sure if, you know, he got named later, they just know Levi is Matthew. Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, and I can't just say this, I have to let you picture this, a despised member of the Jewish community who likely cheated, who likely overcharged, but had been watching in Capernaum all these different things that are going on, hearing the rumblings. He's, he's wondering what's going on, but he's, he's behind his booth, but he dare not go because he's despised, so he stays back. Have you been that person that's like, you know, I think that's for other people, and I, I don't want the attention, and I, I don't think I'm deserving, and I, I, I don't, I don't, I have. That's Matthew. And as we know, Jesus looks at him and he picks the most likely person who has no idea what they would be signing up for. And he says, follow me. And what does he do? 
and he rose and he followed him. And I'm praying right now that the application of that is that if you are hearing Jesus say, follow me, that you'll trust him to follow, which I'm being tested in for sure, as I've told you all my testimony along the way. But we know when Matthew had that like joyous, like, okay, we knew what he was going to have to endure. He was going to get to be a student of the most high God. His rabbi was Jesus. He was going to see healing and deliverance and all this. It was going to be amazing. But he would also end up giving his life for him. And that's the thing. That's the thing in our culture that we don't often get tested in. So we want to honor Matthew and say, Lord, instill in me that kind of faith. Verse 15 through 17, you can put a bracket around. This is number seven. Number seven, for he has authority over tradition. And if you know me, oh, I love that Jesus flips the tables on tradition. Verse 15, and as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. So picture it, Matthew just got invited to Jesus, and he's like, oh, this is amazing. And so he invites his friends to eat in his house, but now Jesus is doing something, and I wrote this down somewhere, that in um, the Old Testament, and I'm sure that I won't see the scripture right away, um, is not lawful to to do this with with the sinners and all of this like he's doing something that was again not normal jewish culture and they would have gotten their first kind of rule book you know in the old testament i know the jews added a lot of their own laws but they were they were operating under things that, that god himself had said you know separate yourself from these people don't intermarry because i'm making you my chosen people god had been doing this and so now this does look strange to the outside. So we have to consider what they're thinking. Okay, um, I want you to, uh, let's see, go back to verse, he was in the house with tax collectors, verse 16, and the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Like, you know, kind of a valid question because they were not used to that. But again, they're spiritually blind. Later Jesus told them, you're like the blind leading the blind. How is it that you're in the scriptures all of the time but you can't see God when he's right in front of you? Lord, deliver us from spiritual blindness that if we ever were right in front of you that we would not miss it. And we wouldn't miss it because of what we thought about doctrine or what we thought about um, tradition, Lord. Let us see you at the table. Verse 17, And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. All right, so I would, thank you, Jamie. I would like to just kind of think about it this way. Jesus said, I am willing to sit with sinners as a doctor is willing to sit with the sick because they need help. They need help. So in some regard, you're like, okay, I get that, but I'm going to challenge this a little bit more. I actually challenged this a few seasons back in the other ministry I was in. I want you to write down, after you put a, a square on the last word, sinners, I want you to write down, do we sit with sinners or sin with sinners? Jesus didn't compromise when he sat with sinners. And we all are guilty of sitting and sinning with sinners. Hey, I know, I mess up. <laughs> I sin, but I am saved, therefore covered by the blood. I am saying to you, I'm not like perfect like Jesus, but I'm perfected in him. But I can either go to a fire pit with my beloved neighbors and have a wonderful time, or I can partake in some things that aren't so good, you know, if they're doing... So it's like, that seems a little gray. Am I sitting with them or am I sinning with them? Well, we were just, you know, at the strip club, but I didn't look and, oh, okay, well. <laughs> but you're showing them Jesus. What would Jesus do? He'd sit with a sinner, but he's not going to go to the strip club to sit with them. He's going to sit with them in their home. Do you see what I'm saying? So I want to challenge our thinking, all of us, and me included, being convicted on what does that look like? All right. Um, J Jamie, I love that you said, yes, they doubted God, so they'll most likely doubt us. Absolutely, especially concerning healing. Yes. 
All right, so sinners. So now we're going to look at um, verse 18, a question about fasting. Now, this is going to um, be interesting because many churches, uh, many uh, programs, different things are doing a fast at the beginning of the year. It's just kind of their, ru their routine. They're, um, they're used to doing that. Many people are on a fast right now, so let's pay attention and see what, what God is saying. So verse 18, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? Be very careful to listen to this. I've had to look at this a couple times. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Can the wedding guests fast? This, they're feasting with the bridegroom. And until we see Jesus on the second coming, we won't get to have what they had in the flesh, right? So we can make an inference already if we should fast or not. So let's listen to what Jesus said, and then they will fast. Put a square around, will fast. He is not, con like, he's not saying fasting's bad. He's saying there is a time and a place and a reason to fast. But certainly when I am at the table with them, they don't need to. So if you've never fasted before, I would write down Isaiah 58. Start there. Read Isaiah 58 and look what God says about fasting. I am going to leave it there because of time, but the Bible is full of examples of Daniel and Esther and Jesus and Moses and a lot of people that have fasted, and we could do weeks and weeks on that, but to just know that it is a thing that's to draw us closer to God, and it's not always fun, and sometimes it's the most fun thing you've ever done, but I would um, encourage you to look into it to draw you closer to God. If Jesus had to fast, and he's God, what does that say about us? So will fast. And off to the side of will fast, remember to write, Jesus fasted. And most importantly, before he went into ministry. So whether it's a day fast, a week fast, a month fast, there's something up and coming. It's a good thing to think about. Maybe I should fast. Verse 21, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. And if he does, the patch tears away. The new from the old and the worse tear is made. So I want you to write down, um, like draw around, square around, um, let's see, new or old or somewhere in there. Um, and just write new framework. The old framework is not working. We need a new. We're not getting rid of it. I've come to fulfill it. But watch what Jesus says. Verse 22, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is destroyed. And in the chosen again, they did a great job like making them think through, well, it would get bigger and it would explode and then it would be all messy. Like they understood that parable because it made sense for their time. The last line says, but new wine, put a square around, new wine is for fresh wine skins. And I would right off to the side, he was connecting that to fasting. He was connecting that to the new way. New wine comes through after fasting. The new way, the new covenant. All right, so here we go. Um, the last number eight of the things he, cho he had authority over is our last section there. And again, you can put a bracket on 23 to the end of that paragraph. Number eight is the Sabbath. Oh my goodness, aren't we just messing people's doctrine here, like thinking about fasting and healing and the Sabbath. I'm not trying to talk about doctrine. I'm just trying to read what this says. I'm trying to comprehend it. I'm trying to look at the definition of things, interpret it with scripture next to scripture, which I haven't even shared half of the scripture I have as I was studying, and then we apply it. And then we give grace when someone sees it a little differently than us. We think, well, that's still my brother in Christ. So, and she's still my sister. So let's be careful when our opinions don't match. But let's stick here for right now. All right, so Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. All right, so um, I want you to write down next to this section, just off the side of the heading, that, you know, there's a lot to say about the law with the Sabbath. And if you want to look that up because you pretty sure you know what this is about, <laughs> just to double check, write down Exodus 20. 8 through 11. Exodus 20, 8 through 11 is the law. And this was a serious law. One of them even had a penalty of death. Exodus, you can write down as well, 31, 14 through 16. 
and 35, 2. So Exodus in there, it's going to say, this is a big deal. This was Jewish law. God took it very seriously. God created the entire world in six days. He rested. We were just talking about this today in one of my classes, like, I hear you, Lord. Because when we don't rest, we're not following what God's design was. But what does the rest look like from the old to the new? We just talked about Jesus is breaking tradition, but he's not getting rid of, he's fulfilling it. So let's watch Jesus fulfill the Sabbath rest. Verse 23, one Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to plug heads of grain, which is a really funny scene, right? Like, oh, hunger, I'm just going to start eating. And, and the Pharisees were like, what? Look what they're doing. Why is this is not lawful on the Sabbath? Verse 25, and he said to them, and again, Jesus is God, so he can say the new has come. Have you never read what David did when he and his was in need and was hungry and those who were with him, of course, they knew exactly what he was talking about, how he entered the house of God in the time of, I was just going to call it Abathar, uh, the high priest, and he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any, but the priest um, to eat and also gave it to those who were with them. Jesus used a scriptural example to calm them down and to say, that happened then. Remember that? We love King David. I'm Jesus. <laughs> And he's saying, this is okay. All right. Then he says, verse 27, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not the man for the Sabbath. I'm going to say that again. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Most important line of the whole thing. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So I would underline man or the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath, because that is where we have to be careful when we get back under the law and start dictating the thing that Jesus came to fulfill. The rest is in him. He's Lord of the Sabbath. And so all the commentaries that I have would say, um, that I have would say, and one of them, I wanted to show you one of them. I know I showed every time. This is just one that you can have. Moody commentary. There's many. Um, we'll talk about, you know, to have legalism in the New Testament, it means we're not under grace. So you don't condemn a doctor from working on Sunday. His Sabbath might be Friday, you know. But the point is, I am being convicted. I have to find my Sabbath rest. I have to. I have to. And longer than 10 minutes. You have to as well. We are coming against the world right now, and this is where I'm going to end. I am coming against the world. Busy isn't better. Doing isn't higher than being. And this is another thing we talked about in class. But it's one thing to think that. It's another thing to do that. And so I think that there's so many people right now that are trying right now to reset and say, I am doing way more than I should be doing, and I want to be more with God. I'm not being present with my family. I'm maybe not being present at even my work, or I'm not, like, we need to find our rest because the world is shaking more. It's getting darker in one way, so we should be rising up and getting brighter. We cannot do that without rest. We cannot do that without fresh new wine. We cannot do that without sacrifice of time and getting rid of all the different secular things that we think we need to do, spending our money on all the things that don't matter, and making space and room for the things that do. So I'm speaking that to me. I am speaking that to you. And I'm now going to screen share my last minute um, as far as my big announcement that um, I was going to give you. Um, so let's see if I can do it here shortly. I'm going to find my button again. Um, as I look for it, I'm going to talk to you. Well, it, it didn't go where I thought it went. So let me go see if I can find it here. And if it's not going to screen share, I'm just going to tell you about it. So hold on, this anticipation. Well, it went to a different place after I hit live. All right. Start praying for me. All right, so tomorrow I am going to open up registration for everybody, but tonight I'm opening it up to join the adventure to finish Mark. Not just to finish it, but to do it well. Um, not just to have a task and not just to say, I read that and now I go on to the next thing. You know I want to linger. You know I want to stay and figure out if it's lining up with Scripture. 
And so what I want to offer to you tonight is if you are ready to continue to make space for God, if you're ready to gather in a community that is looking to Jesus above the word of the world, to look to the word, then I'm asking you and I'm inviting you into this journey. What I would like to offer you in that is if you join, um, your spouse, of course, is going to be free. You want to know why? Because two are one. And that should be that. In addition, if you have kids um, or grandkids or a niece and nephew, I am going to offer you only private access to some kids teaching videos that I previewed last season. And I have to say that there might be even a little bit better than mine. I'm just saying because they're cuter and they can remember <laughs> this stuff. They deliver it so well. So I'm telling you that you are going to see some teaching videos from children who study the word and can deliver it through the same method, although they're going to use some other creativity this time and use some of their giftings to do that. And so that's going to be another thing that I want to offer you in this. Um, still not seeing the screen share. It went away. So I'm going to have to remember the other stuff. Um, so I'm just going to make my screen shorter. Um, other things that I want to offer you is um, the... There it is right there, but oh goodness. The help that I'm going to give you is going to be another activation booklet and guide uh, for each chapter, but also for this whole study method. Something that's going to be new this time that I'm adding into it because I've been learning so much about the importance of testimony is I'm going to put a little bit of testimony at the beginning of each tool that I'm trying to teach you about so I can fan your flame and you can look at it to see what does that look like in action and what did God do? Because testimony means do it again. So it's going to be an updated booklet for you as well. All right. So, and then the last thing is I am offering when you register to um, any of the studies that I've already done, you can purchase those at 50% off and uh, it's going to be 10 weeks in the word together, which will basically finish up right after spring break, those last um, two weeks in March. So it'll just be ready for the sun to be out in the green grass. We will have been in the word together. So tonight, if you register, I'm going to put your name in a drawing to, to be a uh, free. I'm just going to waive your registration fee. And um, so I'm going to put this out tonight for those watching now in the replay. But for those that watch um, maybe tomorrow and you're like, oh man, I will be doing a 50% off drawing um, throughout the day as well for registration. So I, I know the times are hard and it is it's a doozy out there. So I just want to offer that to you as well. And sorry, I can't screen share, but I'm going to drop the graphics on my page here right after I get off and uh, so that you can see all the details of that and have the registration link. So um, Aaron, if you're on here and you can drop the link in the comments, um, you can do that now. Otherwise I can try. Um, I did copy and paste it later, but oh, it worked for me. So there's a registration link, um, which I will post within the graphics as well. Um, all right, there it goes. So let me pray us out. Most Holy Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your way. God, your ways are above our ways, and your plans are above our plans. And all I know, God, is that your word has changed everything in my life. Everything, God, for good and for your good. I have been healed of physical things, of heart things. I have been delivered. I have a stronger marriage than I could ever have fathomed because of what you are doing through us, through your Holy Spirit, through our time in the Word. God, thank you for that. Thank you for the headship that you have built up for me. God, thank you for my children who love you, who love your Word. Thank you for what you've done in me. Thank you for every provision under the sun that you have given me. Thank you for every opportunity to speak and teach your word that you know that I love and cherish. God, what you did in me, do again. Do again through these people that are gathering. Do again through these marriages. God, strengthen them. God, would you raise up these men? Raise up these men in the Holy Spirit of God. I come against passivity in the name of Jesus Christ. And I say, rise up, O men of God. Rise up. You are called for more, and God in you is mighty to save. You have all that you need in Christ Jesus. God, I'm, I'm calling for marriages to ignite for your glory. 
God, I'm praying for these Priscilla and Aquila couples of power, that when they unite, they will do all things for you, God, and for your glory. God, I'm calling for children to turn away from the ways of the world, to stop being caught up in the perversity and the lies and the gender confusion and all of the things that steal, kill, and destroy. May the words of my girl's mouth be a blessing to those that hear it. May it rise up a young generation. God, do, do it again in other children, which you did in mine. Do it in them. Do it in them, God. And Lord, also in my extended family, it is, it is coming out and it is touching other people in my family. God, do that again in other families. This is a generational God we serve, so do it again through our generation. God, thank you for the bloodline of Jesus. We bless you in your holy name for your word. I love you all. Amen.